this week on the Back Table Podcast. We've gotten into this space where laparoscopic hits have sort of taken, you see the volume going up, but it, it's eaten away at the vaginal hysterectomy volume first, and then the abdominal hysterectomy volume sort of stayed the same for a long, long, long time. And then I think finally, after like 20 years, it's gotten better. But you see this data like in California state data. I, saw, I remember seeing this in the 2000s. And you just see that this trend that's been continuing. And then the skill set for vaginal hysterectomy has just continued to go down. Welcome back to another episode of Backtable OBGYN. This is Mark Kaufman, and I've got with me Dr. Amy Park. Amy, how are you? Good. How are you, Mark? I'm good. And this is a special episode of uh, Backtable OBGYN, where Amy and I are going to talk about some surgical techniques. Today, we'll talk about vaginal hysterectomy, and Amy's going to teach me all about how to do a, a vaginal hysterectomy, because I don't think I've done one in a very long time, which is super depressing. I'm assuming you've done them recently. Well, about two thirds of our volume in the Cleveland Clinic is vaginal in terms of approach. For the whole clinic or for your division? For my division. So I would say my approach has evolved to prolapse where I used to do a lot of primary sacral copulpexy for primary uterovaginal prolapse. And then now I'm just reserving sacral copulpexy more for recurrences and post hysterectomy prolapse. So you do them primarily sacrospinous. Is that what's your? I usually do. Well, my vag plate special is the vaginal hysterectomy, bilateral sapingectomy, vaginal uh, uterosacral, so an intraperitoneal vaginal copulpexy, anterior posterior pair cystoscopy, plus or minus a sling, and. I do between 250 and 300 cases a year, and I would say probably the majority of it is vaginal. Wow. Well, I remember I was sitting, I was a member of AHL's, the FMIGS fellowship board for a couple of years, and it was the fellow representative. So it was me and a bunch of guys who were pretty senior to me. And I was just starting my practice and feeling very self-conscious about everything, a lot of imposter syndrome going on. And I was asking the person next to me, and I won't name names, but I was like, when's the last time you did a, a vaginal hysterectomy? And he looked up, he goes, um, 1991. And then like everybody around the whole table, nobody had done a vag hist at the table in like years. None of these senior laparoscopic surgeons. Why? I mean, MIGS is minimally invasive. Vaginal surgery is like the OG minimally invasive method. I know. Well, that's why we're doing this, because we've gotten so comfortable doing what we do. And yes, it's minimally invasive. It's not the least invasive. So this is where you're going to teach me how to obviously not be in the OR with me, but we're going to go over your process for vaginal hysterectomy, because it is something that, you know, where I trained, if it was a a good vaginal candidate, you just kick them across the hall to Eurogyne. And if they had a patient they felt like it was a good TLH candidate, Eurogyne would just kick it back to us. And we divided and conquered that way. But the result was that we got very comfortable with a laparoscopic or robotic approach, but really just did very little, if any, true vaginal surgery in that way. So, and I think that's, I think it's pretty common in a lot of mixed fellowship. Yeah, I think it's too bad. I know at the clinic we, Roseanne Kyo used to do a lot of vaginal hysterectomy and, and Mayo Scott still does a lot of vaginal hysterectomy using the, the Magrina Bookwalter. We do a mix of approaches. But I, I think the interesting thing is the veg hysts that you would do as a generalist are the ones for bleeding. And those are the most difficult ones. I mean, I do those because I get those kind of referrals, not a lot of dysensis, and they have adenomyosis or fibroids. And I'll usually do it up to like 14 week size as long as it's mobile. And those are tough cases. You have to have pretty good skills in order to do the vag hiss. Otherwise, with a prolapse, I mean, you, you really should be doing a prolapse repair with it. So I can understand how it's gotten so subspecialized. You know, and I think that with the advent of V-notes, that's, you know, enabling technology. Essentially, uh, I remember talking to other people and they're like, well, it's just making a vaginal hysterectomy like a laparoscopic one through the vagina. Have you, <laughs> so have you done any V-notes? We had Jan on from Belgium 
a few episodes ago and talked to us all through that. Have you seen one? Have you done one? Have you like trained on one? So I did. I have done the V notes, and the hardest part about it is getting the Alexis retractor into the, the vagina. Rings, yeah, the ring. Yeah, so you have to get the double ring and get a tight seal. And I think the, in order to get the seal, you have to get the peritoneum reaffixed to the vaginal cup, because otherwise you get this huge. It'll just skive that peritoneum off. Yeah, I remember them. I, I did the the course, and the, I remember sewing the peritoneum to the vaginal cup. But now they have a new like introducer. I don't know if you if they if you did it recently, but they have these new like introducers where you shove the ring anteriorly and posteriorly, so it's much easier to get in apparently than it used to be. If you if you've not done one in a while, maybe I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't seen the new ones, but basically the thing about the V notes for me is that when you use new technology, you should try and do it on on easy patients. And I put them on patients. I tr- I booked V notes with these cases that were really hard, like uh, somebody who did not had a fourteen week size uterus, not much dissensus. I booked another one that I didn't realize had endometriosis. So it was really hard to get in. It was completely fibrotic. So just word of advice, just do it on on easy cases. <laughs> but I, I guess that's kind surgery. of my fear for all vaginal surgery is is like everybody, I mean, again, case selection, like the vast majority of the patients that I'm getting referred are big giant uteruses, 20 plus week uteruses, stage three, four endo, bunch of previous surgeries. Like none of those patients are what we would consider or what maybe the average person would consider like good TVH cases or according to the folks at VNOTES, good VNOTES candidates if you've had prior pelvic surgery or concern for adhesive disease and stuff. And I guess, is that similar? I've also heard stories of Roseanne Co. doing like 40-week uteruses, stage four endo, all patently, and that's just like her approach. Yeah, I mean, I think that, the, first of all, choosing the right candidate for surgery is like preoperative selection for any surgery is like, 80% of the decision making. I mean, and then the rest of it is, yes, technical skills and interoperative judgment. But, you know, I always say it's like that Kenny Rogers song. It's no, it's like you need to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. I mean, like that's a lot of it. I think getting back to your point about like MIGs doing TLHs, Eurogyne doing the Vag Hess, we've gotten into this space where laparoscopic hits have sort of taken you see the volume going up, but it, it's eaten away at the vaginal hysterectomy volume first. And then the abdominal hysterectomy volume sort of stayed the same for a long, long, long time. And then I think finally, after like 20 years, it's gotten better. But you see this data like in California state data. I, saw, I remember seeing this in the 2000s. And you just see the, this trend that's been continuing. And then the skill set for vaginal hysterectomy has just continued to go down. I agree. I've seen the data and the numbers. It's hard to find the most up-to-date things, but like end of the 20 teens data, it was still like 45% abdominal hist rates nationally, which seems awful high, but the vag hist numbers went down way more than the abdominal hist numbers with yeah. the rise in laparoscopic and robotic surgery. Part of it, we've talked about this before on the show, the training, right? You have to do 15 of each approach for a total of what, 85 MIS hysterectomies or something like that for training, which is there's a lot of approaches. And if we, the faculty, aren't doing tons of TVHs, it's going to be tough for residents to have that one perfect case. But let's, like you said, you nailed it on the head as always. It's patient selection. It's knowing what's the right procedure approach for that particular patient. And the exam is a big part of it. So how do you determine who gets a TVH? Well, I do have a very specialized practice in prolapse and incontinence as a urogynecologist. So I got a reputation for attempting to do some harder TVHs than other people who would probably just do it laparoscopically. So I do get some of those cases where patient has like atypical endometrial cells on PAP or adenomyosis who want a vag chest. But basically, like I said, if, if the patient has up to 14 week size uterus and it's like tall and mobile instead of the broad ones that are immobile and there's some room inside the vagina. If their pubic arch is like a tight steeple, like r- those are really hard cases. Like the outlet, hearkening back to our obstetric days, when those are really tight, it's very difficult because you need access. Just like a, a, you know, principles of any surgery, you need pr- uh, exposure and access. So 
As long as there's some dissensus, I usually like to have C point, which is the cervix, or at least within like six centimeters of the opening or the hymenal remnant. So C at minus six. But do, do I have a cutoff on that, hard cutoff on that? No, not really. If there's some mobility, if, you know, honestly, I've had a bunch of cases lately who've had a history of endometriosis. I've been able to get in anteriorly and then make posterior colpotomy by putting my finger around. Hmm. But those are hard cases. For me, C-section is not a contraindication. I love the patients. Sometimes they they don't remember they had like four C-sections. I was like wondering why I couldn't get in anteriorly. And then my fellow rounded on her the next morning and she was like, oh, she had four C-sections. I was like, no wonder. But like, I think it just really depends on your skill set and your level. Like for me, I'll, I'll do those cases, history of C-sections and endometriosis. But I think for some people that would be a contradiction, which is totally reasonable. And I think it just depends on your comfort level. And when you're first in attending, you got to put yourself out there and it's uncomfortable. And, you know, you're going to take longer and it's you, there's a learning curve to being an attending. And that's why you can't be a program director until five years out. I mean, you kind of have to have been around the block and you have to like put yourself back on the saddle even when you have complications, you know? So, uh, I mean, th- those are th- those are feelings I just like will never forget, like being, especially being like the first makes person at a place or being, just being new anywhere though. Like you're in these cases, like, like what am I doing? Or, this is just like not easy and not and everybody, it just, the, the pressure on outside of just the clinical work itself, like being a surgeon stop, being a doctor's hard doing these really ridiculously hard cases and you're kind of on your own. Like, I'll never forget this, that feeling. But I think it's also like putting yourself out there, but trying to find a safe way to do that. And I think that can be challenging in certain settings. But like, if I'm going to do a TVH now, I'm going to have one of my partners who is a urogynecologist be there with me to at least the first few times to help getting in. Because to me, that's like one of the biggest, I guess, like cruxes of a case for TVH. Would you agree? Is that like, or is it just like it's all easy to you? Yeah, we we did a survey actually when I uh, one of my first fellows like we surveyed residents and we had them rate the steps of the the case like posterior colpotomy, anterior colpotomy, securing the uterines, utero variants, etc. And definitely anterior colpotomy was the was rated the hardest, and that's definitely the most challenging. I think I think for any surgeon, it's like just pattern recognition of being in the right plane, and that just takes a lot of cases. And you alluded to the minimum number of cases before. That's an arbitrary number. And that is a result of a lot of negotiation. There was a paper published out of the Cleveland Clinic when I was a fellow looking at the minimum number of hysterectomies to achieve competence based on the VSSI, which is the Vaginal Surgical Skills Index, and OSATs, and which is the ob- Objective Structured Assessment of, I can't remember what the T is, but technical skills, I think. And it's between... 20 and 30 cases, like 25 cases, basic 22 to 25 cases, essentially. But uh, or is it maybe 22 to 27? But anyway, you get the the drift. It's like it's in the 20s. And we're saying we basically adjusted that bar lower because people weren't hitting it. Well, it's based on a percentile, right? It's it's, It's based on this is the bottom whatever percentile of cases. And that's the number. It's not the number you actually need to become competent. It's just this puts you in that bottom whatever percentile and we're going to say everything above that gets a pass. Otherwise, they would be yeah. penalizing too many programs. I mean, instead of raising the bar or in- insisting that every program raises their own bar, they're just lowering it for everyone. Is that kind of what happened? I don't know exactly the de- deliberations because I wasn't sitting at the table, but I think, yeah, I mean, what you're describing is essentially grading on a curve, right? And I think it's, just too bad because it's just not enough for most people to feel comfortable with. Like if you're really good, you're really good. This is another thing I say all the time about surgical skills set and training is like either you're born with a beat, you got to cultivate the beat or you have no beat. And like most of us have to cultivate the beat, like just like athletics, like maybe you can get out there and swing the tennis racket and like just be awesome from the get-go, but most of us have to practice and like really iterate and practice and pattern recognition and go through a bunch of complications so you can avoid them in the future. And, you know, it's just not enough repetition to have those kind of experiences. And then it's also really hard to get exposure unless you have two 
unless you're using that Magrita book walter or you have another it's hard to do a vaginal hysterectomy with just one assistant i think it's better to have two assistants and if you're in private practice Hopefully you can have two assistants. I mean, you have to have a really skilled assistant. It's harder to assist on vaginal surgery than it is to be the surgeon in the middle. No, good, and because you can't see. But I, to your music analogy, I was actually I had band practice last night. I've been playing drums for like thirty five years, and I you know, still play with a lot of the same guys I grew up with. And we talk about it like there are guys we know who played music a long time and still just can't like find the beat. They're just like technically they may have skills or they may have been playing for a long time, but sometimes they just don't ever quite have, they can't sort of fit, in, you know, slide into the pocket. They can't really get in the groove. And some people, it's just super easy. But for, for both groups, you have to do the work. You have to practice. keep with it. You have to practice. You have to practice. You have to practice. And so how long have you been out from fellowship? How long have you been out? I have been out almost 15 years. I, I came out of fellowship in 2009. How long before you felt like comfortable in the OR you, you know what? I, I I think it's bad luck to answer this question. I'm not a very superstitious person, but like... I don't mean confident and cocky. Like, oh, I'm not saying, oh, I don't have complications. I'm saying like you wake up in the morning and you're not like, oh, man, what is this case? Like you've kind of seen a lot of things and whatever it is, you for the most part have at least an answer for it. it no case is going to... There's no such thing as perfection. And we're not talking about being amazing. But like, I'm, I, won't, I won't speak for you. Like when I was starting out, like I knew... I mean, I, I stewed and worried about things. And now it's it's not like I don't think about it, but like pretty much whatever I walk into in the OR, like either I can handle it or I know who to call to come in, and take a look at something. Like it's not, I'm not like losing sleep about what's coming up. Like how? I think it's like probably in the range of that three to five years. But I will say the caveat, like just when I feel good about myself, that's when I'm smite with like the three to five complications that come in a row because they always come in threes yep. at least threes so i uh, hesitate to like talk about my confidence in this because it's like when you whenever you feel good about yourself that's when someone or something happens to you know smite you down and because that's the thing about being a surgeon those things always keep you humble and i've seen this graphic about grief and um, i don't know if you've seen it but it's like you know, if you talk about grief as a circle and then this, your being as this other circle around it, they say about like the grief stays the same size, but then you're able to grow around it. And that's how I feel like about complications too. Like the hole that a complications creates in terms of like ruining your life and all that, that does get better with time because you can sort of contextualize it and you've seen it before. So Yes, so I, I still lose sleep over those things and I still worry a lot about all of that stuff. It's just I've grown around that, you know. I love I so, love that analogy. I think I I, I heard the, that grief description relatively recently and I absolutely love it. Like the grief never gets smaller. You just put more love around it and try to find more ways to like make the whole pie bigger. And I think that's something that when I have, you know, I had a new partner who joined me last year. And, you know, I've, I've got that N of hundreds and hundreds of cases over the last 10 years. I've been out now, this is my 11th year out. Or, yeah, I think 2012, 20, no, this is year 12. Complications that happen frequently when you're first starting out, it's a bad place to be because if you have two complications yeah. out of your first three cases versus two complications out of your first 100, it looks different. And so, yeah, I mean, and we'll, I think we're going to, do an episode coming up on complications. And I don't want to spend too much time on that because we'll talk about that more in depth. But I think I'm, I guess I'm talking less about like confidence in that, oh, nothing can go wrong. I am always acutely aware that every case you do, you can be surprised. You can be reminded exactly how difficult this job is. But what I guess what I'm trying to get to is that point in which you're doing this job and go, okay, I feel like whatever comes today, like at least I can, I know how I would approach it. And, I, and, and I have a level of confidence where I'm less anxious or panicked about it. But they, I would say, yeah, the first, it took probably about three to five years where you go, okay, like I'm, I, I might be okay at this job and just like give yourself a little bit of a break because you've got that end of cases behind you where you go, oh, okay, I guess objectively, whatever I think of myself, the numbers say I'm okay at this. So, but that's part of it for like introducing a new thing now, like for me to start doing TVH or, like, you know, if, I, if I'm going to do V notes, Entry is like one of the biggest things for me. So like, I get, yeah, just the process of how you get there. But before we get into the actual OR, we talked about how 
you pick patients to go to the OR, and it's going to be different, like you said, for your patient population, your practice, your experience. Let's talk about your OR setup. Like when you, like, how do you patients come to the OR? Talk about sort of how you set the room up, getting ready for a TVH. So we use the SEDs, the prophylaxis, put patient in high dorsal lithotomy position. I train with candy canes, but um, I prefer yellow fins. I just think it's easier. And I, it's very important with the positioning, bring their bottom so that it is like flush with the end of the bed and to make sure that the knees are facing the contralateral shoulder and there's no pressure on the perineal nerve. So I often will pad them laterally with like a piece of foam just to make sure because during the case, sometimes you have them up in high dorsal lithotomy position and for three hours and they can move a little bit or their knee can move a little bit or what have you. I mean, only if you so need wh- it. So where, where are you placing the pads? Laterally so that okay. just in case. I mean, sometimes the knees are big. They can just have some compression. So I just try and make sure that there's no compression on the peritoneal nerve area. You have to also be careful of femoral neuropathy. Uh, you don't want to at the inguinal ligament. So just, I mean, even though it's high dorsal lithotomy position, you don't want to have too much hip flexion because that can com- cause some compression. So hips flexed 90 degrees or less or more, I'm trying to think. You know, I don't know about the exact angles, but I just, I, you know, just taking a look a- after you put them down at the end of the table and, and make sure that their legs are not overly flexed or extended on the, in the dorsal lithotomy position. I noticed for MIGs, you guys flex the knees a little bit more than I do. I usually leave them a little bit more extended just because otherwise it's very difficult to, for three surgeons to get there into the field because otherwise they're like right these these legs are right over your shoulders. So we extend them and then arms are out to the side. Yeah, our arms are out to the side and just a word on positioning when it's time to sisto I just put the legs down to give them a break. Interesting. Changing position just is good and just a little reassessment. I think the positioning of the of the butt is one of the most under underappreciated steps of any MIS hysterectomy. I think we call it the butt shelf if their butt the sacrum has to be supported. So like that's you know, like is supported at the edge of the mat. Everything distal of that butt cheeks can hang off because that if the butt cheeks are on the mattress, it creates a shelf. You can't put a speculum in there. It it makes the job of a uterine manipulator for doing a TLH way harder. So yeah, having so I'm sure it's the same thing for TVH. Having the cheeks off the bed, having the sacrum supported is like that. Yeah, I don't necessarily put them the cheeks off the bed, but I just like to have them so that essentially the perineum is like right there at the edge of the bed. I pretty much put them on a pink pad or some sort of anti-slip mat, just like you guys do in, in laparoscopy, because we do put them in a fair amount of T-ber. Okay. And they can slip in the bed. So, you know, I use a hippocleanse or a chlorhexidine prep. I know for some people, especially your guys, for some reason are resistant and want to use the betadine. Yeah. So let's talk about that. We're, we're doing a SSI deal at our institution. And that was one of the things we decided on was changing from betadine to a chlorhexidine or a hippocleanse prep because it does seem the SSI rates are lower compared to betadine, right? Yeah. And there was one study that came out that showed that it was chlorhexidine was not superior and, and betadine was, but then all the other ones show that chlorhexidine is superior. I also give ANSAP and Flagyl, you know, or cefazolin and, and metronidazole. I think I'm probably one of the few Eurogynes who does that. I know MIGS, you guys have really taken that up from the... That was the Michigan study, right? Michigan, yeah, the Michigan study. I just figured, you know, metronidazole has such a low adverse reaction rate. It's very, very, very low. And I like the coverage that it provides for anaerobes and potential BV, so... Are you, do- are you doing it routinely? For hysterectomy, yes. Not for routine vaginal cases. I just give cefazolin alone. And then... I set up the the field using a LAV strap, and I put the abdominal aperture on the vagina. I need to think about this for a sec. Do you know the part that you, the big part? You just bring it down. I just bring it down because that's the field. I need the space because oftentimes gives you a lot. It gives you a lot more room. It gives me more room than this like little triangle slit. 
And oftentimes I'm doing a sling. So I just need the room superiorly to the mons as well. The other thing that I do that I love, these two things I, I'm always preaching to the trainees about it, is cutting the the bags so that it's attached to suction. The plastic bag that's catching all the yeah all the stuff to suction. Oh, just so it doesn't weigh it down. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So I'll cut the little nipple and I attach another suction to it. And then the vaginal part, I take off the little sticky things and I stick them to the, there's a sterile underbuttock thing that I use and I just stick it to that so that the water from the cysto and the blood will just go right into the bag. And then I put the piece de resistance is putting an Alice clamp to cover Mr. R, which is the rectum. And the rectum is definitely a mister. So you got to like cover that guy with an Alice clamp because that Mr. R bacteria is going to get all over your field with the sutures and everything else. So I just want to cover that guy up. One of my favorite... On the perineum. One of my favorite drape maneuvers on TVH was to take the drape. So when you put the... what Use a weighted. Yeah. And then you put, put the... Put the drape the, around the, the weighted and use an alice yeah. to snap it. And that keeps the weighted from slipping out. Yeah. Well, that's only a problem when they have like like a soft tissue dystocia problem or they're not far enough down on the, the bed. Maybe I wouldn't have to do that. Yeah. I, I love all the little like drape tricks that we have because... We get one size fits all drapes and they don't exactly have what we think. So remind me, and next time we'll talk about all my draping tricks for TVLH because they're similarly like- There's a lot. Yeah. Oh, man. It's very particular. Like, and then the thing is like, once I tell the fellows and the fellows are like, you're the only one who does this. And I'm like, okay, well, I mean, I can't speak for anybody else, but this is very important because in sacral colpopexy, especially, you're having someone put a manipulator into the vagina and- Sometimes it ends up in the wrong place and you cannot blame people because it's really dark. It's a very enclosed space and sometimes you can't see. And if you cover the rectum up, it just, I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but your probability goes down. Do you know what I mean? I saw, I'm trying to remember who it was, but they used to put the drape, they put like mastisol and then like stick, like glue the drape to the perineum. Yeah, but the Alice is fine. The Alice and then you stick the vaginal part onto the underbuttock, and then the fluid all kind of goes there. Because otherwise, you can get a hot mess underneath the bed from the cysto and the blood from the vaginal hysterectomy. I never thought about putting suction on the bag, but as it always it does, it just pulls down. When you get anything in there at all, it just it weighs, it just pulls the whole drape down. So by putting it on suction, you decrease the weight of the bag with all the fluid in it. Yeah, and then with, when I drain the some of my fellows like to dump the urine in the bag and it just measures it. So you can just measure it that way. I usually just put in, you know, drain it into a bucket. But anyway, I disconnect the Foley from the bag and I do intermittent clamping. So, you know, we do a timeout. I'll put the Foley in, short, deep weighted, get two Jacobs to come tenacula. I usually just use a curved Jacobs on the anterior lip and then a straight one on the posterior lip because then I can always be oriented because sometimes it's really hard to tell. It can get pretty twisted around as you're going up. So then I just inject circumferentially with some lidocaine with epinephrine, either half or 1%, and then just make an incision with a 10 blade. I don't make the teardrop in the posterior fornix because then you get this little divot. And sometimes patients have pain there at the cup. If you, if you go too far back, if you... No, if you, if you make a teardrop, a V... In the posterior fornix. Right. Posteriorly, you make the V, or if you go too far back with the V as opposed to just making it. But even if it's not too far, I mean, like, it just shortens it and they can feel it sometimes at the cup. Huh. So I just do a circle. So what do you inject around the cervix? Lidocaine with epinephrine. One percent? One or half percent. You're doing that to develop the plane or just for bleeding or both? Both. Both. Yeah. And then how much are you putting in there? Just whatever it takes. It's like a 10cc or... Yeah, a 10cc syringe, and then I get a control syringe, put it all around. So knife all around, and then then what? So I always, I use Russians, and I pretty much almost always try and get to the right plane with a knife or either with the knife or the uh, Kurt Mayo scissors. Once you get into the right plane, and this just takes experience, you could peel back the vaginal epithelium cephalad until you get to the peritoneal folds. So I can tell, especially when an elongated cervix, you have to really go far. Like it can be like four or five centimeters back. Because if you think about the cervix, the peritoneal fold posteriorly, it can just be really far up. So 
I'll bluntly push back the, the vaginal epithelium circumferentially until I can see the folds, the vesicouterine folds. It's just so, it's so funny. It's back. It's just so backwards for me because I'm just everything gets pushed up. And when you push up, 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 it like becomes very thin from the inside. Like there's no, I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not searching for anything. It's all kind of right there. Right so, there, yeah. yeah so you, well, yeah. you're pushing so, it away so almost. Just, yeah, I'm pushing it away until I can see the peritoneal fold. And then posteriorly, you can just see that there's just very thin tissue. Sometimes you can get it right away. If there's not too much of an elongated cervix posteriorly. But sometimes it's with elongated cervix, it can be quite far. Or in someone who has stage four prolapse, it can take a while just because this, this tissue is so stretched out. And then you're just taking your fingers and widening it, or do you do it sharply? No, no, no. I just do it with the Russian. I pull it back. Because once you get into the right plane, the tissue will go back. And once you've made your colpotomy posteriorly or to widen it, because you put your long weighted... Yeah. So once I make posterior colpotomy sharply with a curved mayos, I'll uh, affix the posterior peritoneum to the posterior vaginal epithelium with a figure of eight suture. Oh, okay. I'll put the long deep weighted into the posterior cul-de-sac. I usually try and get it anteriorly, either... A- after I take the uterus sacrals or beforehand, you want to make sure the bladder is off because, I mean, if it's a big cervix, it doesn't matter, but sometimes you can be kind of close in these smaller cervices. But I'll take the uterus sacrals, tag those, and hold them, and then get in anteriorly. Are you tagging them because you're going to use them for support later? The uterus sacral ligament, yeah. Yeah, so I just can tell. So, the, you know, the middle one, I usually tag with a straight hemostat, and then the uterus sacrals, I tag with either curved team sets or or kelly clamps it just depends on which hospital i'm at because the sets are slightly different and then i usually get in sharply anteriorly when i see the fold but if i don't see the fold and i think it's kind of difficult like say it's a prior c-section situation or what have you if it's a small uterus i'll just put my finger around the posterior fundus and then put my finger anteriorly and then just bovie on top of it the other thing that you can do to help with delineate the anterior dissection is just push up on the posterior aspect of the uterus and the cervix and just kind of like use a ray tech and, and see if you can like find the, the right plane or, you know, sharply. But I tend to use the finger around the fundus as soon as I can if I'm having difficulty getting in. Because like if you put your finger around and you bovi on top of the finger, I mean, you know you're safe. Yeah. So it, it's just... I'm always going to compare this, at least for now, the way my brain has been wired the last decade of it being a laparoscopic approach. The way I get my uterines, the way I deal with any anterior adhesive disease, any you know C-section scar or whatever, is going lateral to medial because it's always safe. It's always safe lateral. But it sounds like you don't really have that choice vaginally or is it not? Because normally I'd get find the uterines and go just anterior to that and you know find my plane and then kind of work lateral to medial to dissect the bladder off. But at this point, you're going right at it, midline, correct? Yeah, but the, you have to remember the C-section scarring all happens cephalad or superior to where I'm dissecting. Like there's like not much scar tissue lower. It's usually higher. Right, well, where you're getting the uterines, the C-section is going to be above that, right? Yeah, so like in if there's adhesions, going from below, there's less adhesions than from above. I've heard, yeah, so I've heard a lot of your guys say, oh, C-sections are way easier from below than they are from above. Yeah, it is. It's a lot easier. And then if there's adhesions on the top, as long as you can get your finger into the plane the, where the vesicouterine fold is, it's fine. So anyway, the thing to know is just making the anterior copotomy large enough to get the, I use a Heaney right angle retractor, and you don't want to have a little hole. That's a rookie move to lose, lose a hole once you make anterior copotomy. Put the slide the Heaney retractor underneath the finger. And then you want to make sure that kind of all that lateral tissue is pushed back because that's also a mistake. Like if you don't take the tissue off laterally a little bit, the ureter could be hanging out in that area. Which what lateral tissue where? You're saying in the broad, within the broad ligament? like No, no. Like the vaginal epithelium in the first clamp, like when you get the uterine, secure the uterines, getting the anterior and posterior peritoneum right. at a right angle to the uterus. Sometimes that tissue is still hanging around if it's like, you have to like make sure that the vaginal epithelium and the bladder are well off the sides. Those are things, again, you just have to do so many of those to like know where that is. Like again, laparoscopically, I see the uterines. I dissect them, like completely skeletonize them before we do anything, right? You know, before we 
ever deal with bladder stuff. You've gotten your uterines, you're all done with all that stuff before you ever deal with like adhesive disease anterior leave. So thinking about how to do that from below, it's just a different order sometimes. Yeah. So then, you know, I use the curve hidden clamps for all of this. The other thing I will say is that I am a two-handed knot tie OG method person. So we're not using fancy energy devices here at all in Amy's OR. No, we're using Haney clamp, curved Haney clamps, curved mayos, straight mayos. And you got to learn how to drive the needle driver, use a Haney needle driver, Haney stitch everything, two-handed knot ties, surgeon's knots, heel, and then make sure to angle the heel of the clamp to the last pedicle, because otherwise you get dead space in between. And this is just like surgical principles. This is like on an abdominal history. Always too. important to remind, though. It's always good to talk about it. The other thing is, I just don't think you can get a secure knot with a one-headed knot vaginally. I think you just have too many axes, axes that are creating tension. And I also, I, you know, I always caution the trainees. I'm like, this is not practice time. You have to come into the OR knowing how to tie these two-handed knots. No, we could have an entire podcast on that. <laughs> Like, do your homework, please, before you come to the OR. Yes. So, okay, can we ask, can we ask a, just to generally talk about why we don't, like, because Barb Levy and I have talked about this in the past, because she does a lot of energy, uses a lot of energy devices as a vaginal surgeon. Why is it that the laparoscopic surgeons have adopted tons and tons of technology, whereas it seems like it's a little bit slower to adopt for vaginal surgeons? Like, we've got, like, a sure impact or these other brands of handheld devices that can seal and cut. What's Why don't you use those devices? For me, I remember checking it out in fellowship and we had a case where the patient got like a steam burn on the vulva. Oh. I mean, you guys are close to the uter- you know, ureters and the uterines, but when I first came out, I remember seeing a couple of patients who'd had a vesco-vaginal fistula from not dissecting the bladder off. I know a lot of people who use energy. I don't think it's a big deal. I personally am more comfortable using suture. I mean, as you know, we're very close to the ureters with the uterines at all times. And I don't know, I think that's just my comfort level. I don't think it's wrong or right. It just is. Is everybody in your practice using the same techniques? Are there people that you work with? Are you seeing people outside of the clinic or just are using energy? Like, or is it vary among you and your partners? I think all of us use suture. I'm the one who's the most insistent on two-handed knot tie techniques. Like I basically don't allow one-handed for anything on the vaginal hysterectomy, only for like closing the cuff or like, you know. Why is that? Because the knots are, are the knots not the same? I just don't think you, I think you pull up too much and then you push down to, you're not having the right amount of tension. And I like to have the lateral hand, throw the knot, and then tie the posterior hands, the medial hand posteriorly, because that's where you have more room is inside the vagina. Can I just take a moment to just reflect on how neurotic we all are in this business in a good way? And I say that as a compliment to us. Like the way I set my OR, again, we'll talk about laparoscopic kiss in another episode, but just um, we'll, uh, the way we're able to get down into the minutia with the drapes and the tape and the every little thing that we want done a certain way. And part of it is like, oh, well, we're all just not. But part of it is, no, no, I need to control the things I can control because there are so many variables in this operating room that I need to not think about all the other stuff. Like I need to make sure that all the knots are the same. I need to make sure all the clamps are the same. I need to make sure all the steps are the same because there's going to be variability within that. that I can't. That's how I think about it anyway, is that like... I need the setup to be a way that I can make sure that stuff doesn't fall off the table and that I'm not like things aren't tangly. So I can just focus on the one thing that is totally unique and that's the patient. I think it's surgery and also just generally medicine is like that. Like I've seen this expression. I'm not super religious, but it's like God is in the details. It's all of these little things that like will get this patient out of the hospital. It's like glycemic control. Like I remember this guy in the SICU, he was so sick and then we got his sugars under better control and he was extubated. He'd been intubated for like months and months and months. It's just all these little things you have to control. One of the most revolutionary things that has happened over the course of my career is enhanced recovery after surgery. And that is just a bundle of a lot of little things. Normothermia, IV fluid restriction, normal glycemia, lots of things like 
All the pain stuff with Eris, right? Like, like yeah, get their multimodal pain, pain yep. regimen, early ambulation, DC drains early, including folates. Like this is all stuff, early feeding. This is all stuff that's like, it's not one thing. It's like all the things. And that's the thing about surgery. It's all the little things, right? It's a snowball, right? Any little thing, if left alone, can become a big thing. And that's what I counsel my patients and their families. They call me with the little stuff. That makes me feel smart when I can fix the little thing. Because if we let that go, that little tiny thing becomes a big thing after two, three, four, five days. Just if you're not sure whether to call or not, just call. Just going back to the steps of the hysterectomy, I just sequentially go up with the clamps up the uterine ovarian. Again, making sure that the last, the heel of the clamp is at the last pedicle. Hey, knee suturing, two-handed knot tie. Till I get to, to uterine ovarian. I think the thing about the uterine ovarian is you don't want too much t- tissue. You don't want too much, too little. You want just right. Because if you put too much tissue in the clamp, it's really hard to get all, you know, cinch down that pedicle. And some of the vessels can just retract laterally. Conversely, if it's too small, you can shear it when you're manipulating the uterus, if it's just the little piece of the round left. So I also double tie that. I used to put the free tie on first and then do a transfection suture, but now I do the transfection suture first. And then I hold that with a, either a Kelly or a coker, depending on what my uterus sacrals are tagged with on the set. And then I pull the utero ovarian tag. I look for the tube and the ovary. I look for the fimbria, then I take the tube. One thing I've been doing a lot of lately that I've been kind of liking is using a endo loop for the tube or the ovary if I have to take them out. You don't even need a clamp. You just lasso it, push it down. It's so easy. It's awesome. So you do it around the whole tube. If you're just doing the tube, you'll do an endo loop around the entire like Mises Alpinks and just cinch it out? Yeah, and then just cut it. But usually I just, it, I only do that if it's high up or if it looks like it's hard. But I usually clamp it with either, uh, usually a Zeppelin clamp or a uh, Haney, and then I, mm-hmm. I use a, a transfiction suture of 2.0 Vicryl and a, a SH. All the other ones, I use zero Vicryl on a CT1 pop pop off. And you can get the Mesa Salpings for the two probably in two clamps? No, just one. Just one all the just way across? One. Okay. Yeah. But if it looks like really flimsy, uh, the, end of, the end of loop is really nice because what sucks is losing the pedicle. You're like, oops, it's just came right off. And then I take the uterovarian and the uterus cycles because I've tagged those guys and I look for any dead space bleeding. I'll put an Alice on any areas that look like they're bleeding and I'll just put a little figure of eight suture to close off any dead space. And then I'll cut the uterovarian long just in case I need to grab it in the future. And that's that's it. And then I do Sisto. Sisto and then close or close then Sisto? Actually, uh, to be honest, I do the uterosacral first and then I do the anterior pair and I do the sling and then I Sisto. But I have partners who will cysto after every single step. I usually cysto after vag hist if I am worried. Like I put a bunch of stitches. But you won't cysto after the cup closure if you've already cystoed for at the after the uterus sacral. Is that what you said? You cysto after. I usually cysto after I've done after the sling. So I do the uterus sacral stitches, anchor them, tie the cup. Or no, sorry. If I do anterior repair. I'll put in the uterus sacral stitches, hold them, do the anterior repair, close the anterior repair, anchor the stitches, tie down the cuff, put in the sling, then I'll do the cysto. I mean, the reason why I do that is that the statistically, the uterus sacrals have about a 4% entrapment rate. Vag hist, it's about 2%, lower your urinary tract in, um, injury rate. And then anterior repair is like 04 to 0.5%. So the uterus sacral is the big step where you worry the most about yeah. your uterine injury. But like 96% of the time, it's not a problem. <laughs> so, you know, you, do you practice for the 94% or do you practice for the 96%? I, I practice for the less than 1% because when I do a TLH, it's a stow every time. And I, you know, luckily you've seen jets, but just... Yeah, I, but I mean, I'm just saying like, like if you add up all that time, is that you cysto after each step? It's a lot. It's a lot of steps. And if you, like I said, I do 250 to 300 cases a year. If I did that, added up all those minutes that I'm- You're cystoing for days. Doing the cysto for for 4% of the time is the highest percentage. I mean, if you added that up, it's what, like 5, 6% or something, 7%. But it's still like 93%, you know, of the- Of the time you're not seeing anything. Of the time is, 
Yeah. So anyway, that's that's my rationale. It is a pain when you don't see jets and you have to like take it down. But then I take down the uterosacral distal stitch first. And then if I don't see it, I still, then I take down the other two stitches and that takes resolves it most of the time. Have I had an anti-repair uteral kinking stitches? Yeah, but it's so rare. How do you close? Well, because I put the uterosacral stitches, the anterior and posterior cuff, when I tie down the uterosacral stitches, it closes the cuff. So it just kind of goes, pulleys it up. Yeah. So you're not running the cuff in any way. You're not. No. Sometimes I have to do a figure of eight in the middle, but most of the time I don't. I just have to see it. That was where I think John Delancey, or the Michigan guys used to have a, a laparoscope that would film some of their cases. And I know Roseanne Co. does a version of that too. Sometimes being able to get in there to see things in vaginal surgery is tough. And so these people who've been innovative in how they record their vaginal cases is pretty incredible to see how they do that. Yep. So. Well, that was a masterclass. I feel like I'll have to listen to this a couple of times because it, it, it is, to you, it's just so routine. It is just like you do these in your sleep, honestly, just the steps. It's just, there's no thinking involved. It's just, it's, it's unconscious competence. You've just done it so many times. And to get from conscious competence to just having it be routine takes years, takes cases and cases and cases. And so I think that's, it's so easy to you, for you to come to, to a show like this and unprepared and just, this is what we do. And I'm thinking, wait a second, let me get a pen. But amazing. I think our listeners are going to be pretty excited to hear about how Dr. Amy Park does a TBH. I don't know about that, but. Oh, I'm excited. And I got to call my resident back here in a minute. Dr. Nan is a fan of the show and is going to be fired up to hear this. Well. The other thing that I will say that I think has changed over the years is that, you know, when I was training and probably when you were training too, because we're similar vintage, THs were a second year case. But like I'm taking these second years through their first hysts and they don't get abdominal hysterectomies until their fourth years. And they're not easy cases. They're all the onk cases. Right. They're they're all the toughest. They're all the ones that like we don't do laparoscopy. I mean, I've done... I mean, five, 600 cases, in, in, you know, uh, hysterectomies. I mean, thousands of cases, but less than 1% open in that time. I mean, again, all, so they're just not seeing very much of it, especially if they're operating with me. But yeah, it's it, it's it's a tougher time, I think, to train. We did, in residency, I saw like almost no laparoscopic hysts. Like I saw it was all open and vaginal. I, I, almost no laparoscopy in my residency program. Very little. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think that the, the whole like training experience is different in the operating room. And so I think people have to... Be like Dr. Lerner and just sim it up, lots of sims. Yeah, I mean, I think that's 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 the thing, but a sim lab isn't going to help with like, you know, throwing knots. You got to like throw a loop over your scrub tie and like just watch some TV and, and do some knots, you know? Hundreds and hundreds before you ever go in the OR, 100%. Seriously. So... I mean, because the same lab will give you some of these steps with these technical skills, you have to practice. So, and I don't think I'm alone in that. I think everybody... If you if you come to my OR and you can't load a needle laparoscopically, I can already tell you've not done your work to get ready to close this cuff. I cannot watch you struggle to load the needle and expect you're going to be able to run a cuff back and forth. You've got to be able to do these steps in a lab. You've got to be able to practice doing this a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of times. So when we're in the operating room, when that precious, precious time... In the OR, you can use it to learn how to operate, not how to practice your technical skills. And that's a big differentiator. So anyway. You have to, if you know how to do it, then you'll get to do more, right? Oh, 100%. Like I know there were cases that I did as a resident that the attending was like a little shaky, but I was like, surgically, I was still a resident, obviously, but like technically, laparoscopically, like I was really good with my instruments. So like I could grab what they wanted me to grab and my, you know, hold tissue certain ways and do things. That kept that case laparoscopic and many times they would have, would have just been like, I, we can't keep going because we don't, we can't keep moving. So, you know, having someone who knows the anatomy, but, ha- but be, the, the better you are in the OR, the more, the more practice you've done out of the OR is going to make that time in the OR go a whole lot better for everyone, especially the learner. So I agree. All right. You're the best. That was awesome. I feel like I have so much to learn. Again, we talk about doing this for a long time, the minute I feel good, just put me in a bad chest and I'll be reminded very quickly how hard this job is. But I need to get back on the horse. I got to do it again. What, what percentage of your cases are laparoscopic or do you do robotic? No, I do conventional laparoscopy. I do probably like a quarter. So uh, of your hysts or TLHs? Actually, just laparoscopic sacral colpopexy, really. Not doing many TLHs? 
No, because I do primarily. I mean, I did earlier in my career. At least pretend like next time over. we do this, pretend like I'm, I can tell you something about laparoscopic. I mean, I have to feel <laughs> like I know how to do something. Yeah, no, I mean, you definitely do <laughs> way more laparoscopic hits than I do. We'll come back and we'll talk about TLH. Perfect. You're the best. I know you're busy. Let's uh, let's finish this up another day. We'll come back and talk about laparoscopic hysterectomy. Dr. Amy Park, master class on vaginal hysterectomy. That was awesome. Thank you. And have a good rest of your week. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to follow the podcast, rate it five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable OBGYN on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable OBGYN is hosted by myself, Mark Hoffman. And Amy Park. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from Taylor's version Hess and Yvonne Orvijinski. Show notes and social media by Jody Lenora. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Music written and performed by Scott Baby Daddy Hoffman. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on Backtable OBGYN are their own and do not reflect the views or positions of their employers or any entities they represent.